Hello, and welcome to our virtual reading group extra with Sarah Squire. I'm Christy Horpedal, and today we are continuing and ending our VRG conversation on William Shakespeare's Henry Tetralogy with Henry V. France is conquered, Henry gets the crown and the girl. Um, but what I'm interested in to start is whether you think that Henry has changed at all throughout the course of the Henry plays or in this last play? Or do you think that he's remained fundamentally unchanged in spite of all these experiences he's had? Uh, it's a good question. I think the play's interest is less in how ha Prince Hal changes into King Henry V. Right, it's less about that change and much more about the changes that Henry V is able to make on the nation around him. Um, I, I think, you know, I think because so early in the Henry IV plays, we get that moment where Prince Hal says, all right, guys, I'm gonna just take a minute here, break the fourth wall and tell you all about my plan, which is to act like an idiot for a couple of years and then reveal myself to have been all the while, you know, someone who's going to be a great ruler and a great king and a, and a you know, a model uh, for England. So I don't know that it really changes. We see him pull off this plan. Um, we, see, we see that it works um, and that he does it successfully. But since he tells us so early on exactly what he's gonna do, what we have over the course of the plays is the pleasure of watching that those plans work themselves out and come to fruition. Um, so it's less like, you know, big reveal um, for us because we've been in on it from the beginning. Um, it's a big reveal for the people around him. Um, but I think, as I said at the end of the, the last VRG session, um, I think the um, one of the things the play is really interested in is the way that um, Henry V uh, works to build a nation at the same time that everything else is going on. Um, I think that's something that the first time I watched it through, I wasn't paying attention to what's happening with the Welsh and what's happening with the people that he's bringing into England. Um, and I think at first I watched it more as England versus France, as opposed to thinking about creating England in addition to fighting France. Right, well, you know, one of the things that we're told several times that Hal, and I'm gonna keep calling him Hal because it's shorter than Henry V. One of the things that Hal has inherited from his father, right, is this nation where you're never quite sure uh, whether those, earls in the north, particularly the guys close to the Scottish border and the guys over the border are going to sort of come down and try and attack you when you're busy uh, defending yourself on, in, on other borders, right? And so there's this constant fear about, um, about people coming from the north. Henry IV begins with this uh, detail about the, the Welsh women violating the bodies of the soldiers, right? So we hear a lot about that. There's those dangerous Scots. We don't hear a lot about Ireland, but Ireland would have been, I think, much on the minds of uh, the Elizabethan Englishmen um, in some important ways. And we hear again and again, you know, uh, Henry IV tells his son, you've got to, um, you have to engage in foreign wars because things are so unsettled at home that if you don't distract people with a good war overseas, they're going to turn on each other and fight each other at home, right? So how has this nation that's just full of squabbling and argument and betrayal, right? And one of the things they cut out of the hollow crown, that I cannot forgive them for cutting out, is this great scene when Hal uncovers uh, the traitors in his midst, right? Scroop and C Cambridge and uh, um, Gray, I think, right? And there's this incredibly dramatic uh, scene that's well done in Branagh's Henry V. Of, of revealing uh, who these traitors are and that Hallis had his eyes on them and then he purges them from the kingdom through execution, right? So he's well aware that he can't rely on his nobles, right? So he's got to build some kind of stable home base, 
right? And he's going to do that, you know, at enormous cost to the French. I actually watched the Brenna version last night because you had mentioned it so much in the virtual reading groups, and I'm and I'm glad I did. Um, one scene that I thought was well done in both of the movies that I think somebody could miss because it happens so fast and right at the beginning is the scene about the church uh, going in to talk to Henry. Um, you have written about that before. Uh, do you want to tell, share a little bit about your thoughts on that scene and why it's an amazing scene, especially for someone who's interested in liberty, who's interested in what is the proper role of these institutions to help human liberty and flourishing? I think that scene is so important and I think it would be easy for someone to just skip it over or not think about it very much. Yeah, I love the scene and I think we skip over it because we all want to get to the uh, extremely funny, slightly raunchy scene about the Dauphin sending Henry a, a box of tennis balls and then it's full, full of jokes about tennis and balls and you know all of that stuff right and it's it's very funny and it's very well done and so like preceding that you get lord knows how many lines about the salic law which is an obscure legal argument about whether inheritance descends only through the father or whether it can descend through the mother and if it descends through the mother hal has a legitimate claim to the throne of france and you know whatever and then you also have this scene where where the the churchmen are called in and are asked to sort of asked by Hal, you know, kind of, is this a moral kind of a thing for me to do? And the churchmen have this nice little conversation among themselves about, you know, is it, is it legitimate from this, make this claim? Which way do we think that the king is leaning? And one of them uh, points out, and you'll forgive me for not having the, the names of all of the churchmen right at the, the top of my, my brain at the moment. But one of them says, you know, he's, he's leaning our way, you know, because we've made really good arguments. Oh, and because we've just We've offered him more money than the church has ever offered another monarch in the history of the church uh, for him to go to war with France and stop uh, this stop this law that's going to infringe on church property. Right. So we're going to we're going to slide him buckets of cash uh, on the side and he's going to not pass this law and we're going to support his war in France and everyone will be very happy. And I've, I've referred to this, I think I've called it in print, um, something like 240 lines of hot uncensored public choice action, which is what it is, yeah. right? I mean, you're see, this is rent seeking um, at its most pure, at its most unadulterated, right? And it's, it's an incredibly important moment for the play because after that scene, you hear claim after claim after claim from the English, particularly from Hal, about the moral nature of the war that he is waging, about the justice of his claim to France, about how God is on his side, about how the, spoiler, tremendous victory of the outnumbered English over the uh, enormously well-funded, powerful French forces at the Battle of Agincourt, how that's evidence that God is rooting for England, right? And that scene at the very beginning makes all of those claims a little more complicated to think about. Yeah. And, and I don't think that's an accident. No. And I love the moment. So I love tropes where people are supposed to be disguised and it's so clear that that <laughs> wouldn't actually work, but still plays within plays, people who are disguised, but not really disguised. Yes. Two of my favorites, but I love the moment when the common man says, well, that's more than I know, <laughs> when disguised Henry says his claim is good. And I think right. that, that moment reminds you, hopefully, of that beginning, right? Yeah. Of saying, look, to the common man on the ground, the legitimacy of this claim is not only not clear, but also, in a sense, doesn't matter because he has to be there because he's a subject. He's not there because the claim is good or the claim is bad. He's there because he's the king's subject. So I really, yeah. I did enjoy that that moment in that conversation a lot. Yeah, and I think we we see also, right, I mean, we see also sort of a series of provocations by the French throughout the course of, of the invasion of France, right? I, you know, the, the, the Dauphin sends the tennis balls at the very beginning, and he's like, this is just, 
you're this piddling little boy king and I, you can't defend your country. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they keep sending uh, during various uh, various moments, they keep sending the Herald to, to Henry to ask um, if they're ready to give up yet. Right. Are they still planning to keep fighting? Right. Do they really want to do this because they're about to get their butts kicked and all of the rest of it? And Henry gets really um, justifiably worked up about that. Why should they mock for us such poor fellows thus? Right. We are, you know, the, the English are hugely outnumbered. Most of them have dysentery, um, which we know from the historical record Shakespeare knows and Henry refers to them as being sick. They're you know, they're beaten up, they're far from home. Talk about supply chain problems, right? Um, and the French have this massive cavalry, right? And armor and all of the rest of it. And they're they're taunting the English, right? And there's that great scene before the Battle of Agincourt when the, the French are just hanging out in their tents, uh, boasting and playing dice for, for the, the soldiers that they'll take in the next, in the battle the next day. Um, and so I think, um, we get a, a series of justifications for the war, right? We get the ones, we get the legal justification with the, the Salic law, we get the church justification, which, you know, maybe not much of a justification at all. And then we get these personal ones, right? We don't like the Dauphin. He's a jerk, right? And we know it and Hal knows it. And we sort of want to watch Hal kick him in the can, right? And then the French just act like jerks, right? And uh, you know, we get really, uh, Shakespeare's very good at getting us um, emotionally invested um, in in this war, right? Regardless of what we think about the actual justifications for it. So that makes me think of the, the big sort of reveal for me. I, I knew coming into the play that England was going to win and France was going <laughs> to lose. I had that much history in me. I, I didn't come into the play knowing the scale of the losses on the two sides. And that yeah. that was a surprise to me. Um, I, I, I kind of knew the direction, but I didn't know the size, right? So, um, and that makes me wonder, are we supposed to think that that's because God was on England's side? So Shakespeare as an author, is he presenting that to us as, as evidence that God has recognized sort of the legitimacy of Henry as the king and that England is sort of better than France in this way? Um, as, as someone watching the play, do you think that's one of the things that we're supposed to take away? Uh, I certainly think it's one of the things that Shakespeare's audience would have taken away. When uh, the English... Uh, um, dispose of the Spanish Armada um, in 1588. Um, it is attributed it, it is attributed to uh, the, of course, the power of the, the English Navy and really sort of establishes the, the English Navy as a real suit going power. But people also talk about the divine wind that blows in the right direction to assist the English fleet in, in turning away the Spanish Armada. And it's taken um, as a sign that, you know, Elizabeth is a ruler of enormous significance and that God is on her side and that God is on England's side. And so I think that would have been absolutely um, one of the things that, that Shakespeare's audiences would be taking from these moments in the play. I mean, historically, we know um, that one of the things that happens is that there's just so many French cavalry on the field that the, the longbows, the English are using these, these enormous uh, uh, longbows and arrows, and they're able to just pick off the cavalry um, during the charge. And then the horses in front fall and their riders, their armored riders fall on top of them. And then you pick off the guys behind them. And what you have is a battlefield that is so crowded with dead and dying horses and men in armor that you're, you know, your infantry can't move, right? And the English, because they're not as well supplied, and because Agincourt, we think, was very muddy that day, we think the, the battlefield was muddy, and which is also not good for your cavalry, right? The English are poorly supplied, so they're lighter, so they're nimbler, right? It's not, they're not exactly doing guerrilla warfare, but they're a, a, a smaller, lighter, nimbler troop against a heavier uh, troop 
And this is one of the times when being outnumbered is actually useful and is actually helpful. Um, and so they're they're just able to, you know, they're just able to take out the French um, in, at extraordinary numbers. Um, we don't think the numbers are the same as they were listed in Shakespeare's play, but they're uh, there's uh, huge differences between the number of uh, French troops who were lost and English troops who were lost. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one question, one more question, and and I want to give you an opportunity to talk about what your favorite speech or favorite exchange in this play is. So I'll let, I'll let you do that first, and then I've got one more question after that. I mean, there are so many. Um, I love the battle speeches. Um, I know one, right? Uh, there are so many. I love the battle speeches. I love the speech before Harfleur. Nobody uh, can dislike, I think, the, the St. Crispin's Day speech. I also really like um, Hal's wooing of Kate. Um, I think that's a beautiful scene. And it's interesting to me because Hal has gotten so far with the power of language for so long, right? He can talk to any tinker in his own language. He uses the, his, his facility with language and his personal charm, kind of get his troops working together, despite the fact that they're made up of, of English and Welsh and Irish and Scotsmen who are generally at each other's throats all the time, right? But he, he uses that linguistic facility, he uses that charm to make that happen. And then there's Catherine, who, at least in the context of the play, he really likes. He likes her a lot. And he can barely talk to her and she can barely talk to him. So how do you woo someone who you can't talk to, right? If you can't have a conversation and conversation is your main tool, you know, how do you make that work? And so, you know, if, I think it's a beautiful scene. It's a funny scene. Um, it's a it's a tender scene. It's a scene that's enormously complicated when you remember that Hal threatens to let his soldiers rape the women of Harfleur uh, before the siege. But um, but uh, the scene as it stands alone is is it's a lovely scene. Um, and I, I think, think about I think what a challenge that must be to stage um, as well, right? Because you're really you got to really rely on some charisma <laughs> uh, between those characters because the the language won't just pull you through, I don't think. Um, right. But but I do wanna talk about the, the speech at the Battle of Harfleur, because yeah. one thing that I've been thinking about is the, the terribleness of that speech in the sense that he's not only threatening the mayor of Harfleur at that moment and everyone in it, but what he's yeah. also doing is he's telegraphing to his men what should happen if the peace is refused right so there's there's two two things going on right he 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 wants i think to scare the mayor so much that they don't have to do any of those things but the gamble he's taking is that if the mayor doesn't basically say you win he's given all of these englishmen basically the order to do the most awful things that they can to, to sort of show this city that they, that they can and they will. Um, that is, it's a really hard thing to watch, especially in the Kenneth Branagh version, it's very mm -hmm. demonic. Um, the way he looks and the way it's set up. Um, yeah, it's at night and there's fires all around it. Yeah, and he says, I'm, I'm gonna just read a little bit I will not leave the half-achieved Harfleur till in her ashes she lie buried. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up and the fleshed soldier rough and hard of heart in liberty of bloody hand shall range with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. I mean, you know, it, it, the, the threat here is very real. Right, and it would have been a very real reflection of what it would be like to be a civilian in a war zone in Shakespeare's time, and indeed in our time. Um, you know, we have to read this and think about Ukraine, 
um, reading it right now, right? Um, and we don't like hearing it from Hal, who we've grown to like over the, the course of, of three plays. Um, and I think you're right. I think he makes the speech because he's very much hoping that by making the speech, he will prevent the need to have to do any of this to Harfleur. Um, do I think that he's prepared to do any of this to Harfleur? I'm not sure. He's very careful, and Shakespeare is very careful to show us in later scenes how instructing people not to violate civilians, not to take their property. Uh, his friend Bardolph is hanged with Hal's approval for stealing from a church. Uh, Nim, also Hal's friend, is hanged for uh, um, looting corpses on the battlefield. Um, so I think it's, I think that we are being shown Hal's willingness to use this language to accomplish it, but we are, Shakespeare is also trying to reassure us that Hal wouldn't follow through on it. I'll have to think about that more. That it's, ends with sort of a question mark because I'm yeah. not sure. I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I think one of the other things that this play is interested in showing us is um, that you know, war is sometimes war is a thing that happens, right? And we can argue about the justification. We can argue about the necessity of it, right? But war is a fact of life for the early modern uh, Englishmen, right? And with that comes some really, really bad stuff. And it's just part and parcel of it. There's glory to be had, there's honor to be had, there's treasure to be had, but there's also raping and there's pillaging and there's looting and there's loss of property and there's all of the things that uh, the uh, Duke of Burgundy uh, lays out in the, in the last act when he talks about how France has suffered. Um, and how you've lo they've lost an entire generation of arts and sciences and children's education and all of the rest of it. And that's, you know, that's that's a very real part of the play. And I think it's it's a part of the play that um, never ceases being worth considering and thinking about. But the part that kind of makes me circle around it is with a different speech, would his men have behaved differently if Harfleur hadn't given up, right? Does, do his men hearing him say, put infants on pikes, that's what we'll do, yeah. make them do something even worse than all of the other horrible things that they probably would have done anyway. And I know we're not yeah. going to be able to answer that question today, but that's, that's probably the biggest one I look forward to left. reading your alternate history of the, uh, the Battle of Agincourt and the, the yeah. siege of Harfleur. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, and, and I don't know that Shakespeare gives us a single answer. Um, so my last question is, yes, we work at Liberty Fund. This is yeah. a Liberty Fund reading group. Um, yes. and, and so I, I've been trying as we talk about these plays and, and watch these plays to think about what are the big liberty moments? What are the big human freedom moments? And so, I thought I would, that would be my ending question to you is as someone who cares deeply about liberty and human dignity and flourishing, um, what, are, what are the moments from this tetralogy that you think are of particular interest to people who care about liberty and who care about creating and preserving spaces for liberty in the world? I mean, I think Hal's insistence on becoming a person rather than just an heir, um, is is an interesting uh, possibility. Um, Falstaff is a very complicated picture of liberty. You know, he's he's a libertine, um, certainly, um, but he does push on what's allowable and what's not allowable, right? And when are we free and when are we not free? And I think those are those are big questions that surround him, and it's one of the reasons he's such a such a compelling character whenever he's on the stage, right? Um, and I think to uh, moments where we see the, con I th I'm a huge Flewellen fan, let me be clear. And I think he is terribly mistreated in the Hollow Crown because they take out all the good stuff about Flewellen and they just leave the grumpy stuff. Flewellen in the play spends an awful lot of time talking about military history and talking about the laws of arms. 
and talking about the ways that if you must wage war, there are rules for waging war to keep behavior within bounds, right? And this is how we behave when we're in a camp. And this is how we behave during a siege. And this is how we behave on the battlefield. And so there's this voice of a guy who's not, you know, he's just a guy. He's not Lord Flewellen, right? He's a, is he a captain, I think. Right. Um, so he's a military man of some training and some expertise. Um, he's obviously had some education along the way because he's quoting or at least seems to have read Plutarch. Um, but uh, he cares enormously about doing the right thing and about making sure that the people around him are behaving responsibly. Right. When they could be running amok. Right. And so I think characters like that are in a lot of ways where the heart of the play lies, not just the grand historical pageant, but the heart of the play lies and where, where a lot of the heart of the discussion of liberty is hiding as well. I did like that in the Kenneth Brana version, there's the great scene with Flewellen where he's telling one of the soldiers to not talk so loud. And he says, yeah. the French, the French are making all this noise. And he says, my paraphrase, like the French are being asses, right? That doesn't mean- yes. That we is, get to do that too. Um, Shakespeare. This might be this might be the thing that I quote most often on my Facebook page, Christy, which is, "Look, you, if the enemy is an ass and a fool and a prating co uh, coxcomb, do you think, look, you, it is it is uh, meat that we should be the same, right? In other words, just because the idiots are doing it, you don't have to meet their idiocy with the same sort of thing, right? I mean, Flew Allen is great. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can't think on a better note to end than that one, just because other people are being idiots doesn't mean we should be. Um, and we should also respect time limits and people's time. So I want to thank you for all of these conversations. I've enjoyed them and learned so much, and I hope we get to do it again soon. So do I. I hope that we'll be able to do them for the next uh, the next VRG, and maybe you and I will catch up together again for John Stuart Mill in December. I would love that. Um, for our viewers, uh, I just want to remind you that Sarah Squire is a senior fellow at Liberty Fund, as well as a Shakespeare scholar, and this conversation is in part inspired by our virtual reading group hosted by Liberty Fund on Richard II, Henry IV, Part 1 and 2, and Henry V. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, please feel free to get in touch if, if you're interested in these conversations and want to hear more of them. Thanks so much, Christy. Thank you, Sarah. Soundstripe.